So we, we want to talk about the Dream ad monetization platform. Uh, and this came out of a conversation we had with uh, the Apodeal guys. So uh, I want to make sure that we kind of explore it uh, in, a, in full, um, in, you know, very full. And so we have a fantastic group of people with lots of experience from different perspectives. And it's kind of, it's always fun when you have your old boss on stage, um, which is, you know, kind of intriguing. So um, fortunately, here's somebody who knows a lot more about the, um, the ad monetization side of, than even I do. So um, what we're going to do is I'll ask you guys just to introduce yourselves, um, and uh, we'll kick off into uh, some of the questions we're talking about. So Mika, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, hey, everybody. So Mika. Um, the guy who used to accept his expense claims. Um, Big expense claims. Uh, eventually, I just had to quit. So, uh, no, I was, uh, I was back in the days. I was running a global BD for Amplifier. We got acquired by Unity, and then I was running Unity Ads, uh, global BD for quite some time. Uh, moved on to Outfit Seven, which is the, my talking dumb guys. Got acquired by Chinese chemical company, whatever. Um, so I was the CRO, looking after UA uh, monetization. All different things, and uh, and uh, yeah, I kind of have some insight on mediation and ethic. I hope. Pleasure to be here. We've kind of been on both sides, haven't you? That's the key thing. That's the problem. Yeah, <laughs> that's the problem. <laughs> Sorry. Hi everyone. My name is Sarah Tam. Um, I'm the game monetization specialist at Eastside Games. Uh, we are a indie uh, studio up in Vancouver, Canada. So hello everyone. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> And um, so uh, we do a lot of um, our own games. Our recent one is Trailer Park Boys, which reached uh, top 100 in 100 countries. So really excited to be here to talk about monetization. Cool. And Esso. Hi. My name is Esso from Metamoki. Uh, we're a game developer from San Francisco, uh, known for Mob Wars, Fruit Pop, and most recently, we released uh, Wiz Khalifa's Weed Farm. Um, I manage product, monetization, UA, sometimes art direction, some game design, and other stuff. So the last panel talked a lot about kind of like choosing the right partner and things like that. I want to try and get a bit more practical. So the first question I want to really ask is, what is it you guys, you know, what causes pain for you? What's the thing, what's the sort of tools that would make your job easier uh, in terms of, you know, monetizing the products you work with? Who wants to start with that? I said you want to start with that? Yeah. Well, um, I guess I just need more people, <laughs> but um, I guess tools-wise, uh, you know, since we're actually a pretty small company, um, you know, we work with, I don't know, four or five different ad networks. Uh, we've used, uh, we're actually using two uh, mediation platforms. It's really hard to negotiate uh, with each platform and also do my other jobs. Um, I don't know, I guess maybe uh, which there was like a little bit more transparency because it always feels like, you know, maybe we could be doing better. Or we're probably leaving money on the table. Um, so uh, I don't know, I guess it's just a matter of like, you know, negotiating the best rates, you know, with our ad partners. Mm. Can you hold the mic closer to your mouth? That way we'll get the feedback from the listener. Sure. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah, kind of to build off of that too, um, a lot of the tools that we use is, uh, you know, the dashboards that a lot of our mediation platforms have. Uh, we also have our own in-house, um, so just kind of combining everything and uh, seeing where the trends are. It's, it takes up quite a bit of my day just mm. to kind of like look through all the different dashboards, social media, all the analytics tools, you know, and coming together and really understand who our customer base is and the players. Is it cheeky to ask which ones you work with? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we use, um, you know, like some of the big guys like Iron Source, mm. um, Bungle uh, for mediation, like Char and Charboost as well. Cool. Yeah. Cool. This is going to be the boring panel because I'm a I agree with these guys. So. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, I forgot to mention, I'm currently like advising different games companies, helping typically on that monetization side, but also a little bit of UA. But I can, I can add to the, the that that, you know, it's also it's the same problem whether you're a small team or a big team. At Outfit 7, we had about 200 people in the company. So I had a team in, uh, my team in London was looking after the, the ad revenues, the ad ops team. Small team, same problem. You go staying with the partners, who's the right partner, testing new stuff, all this track, you know, th all these tricks. And then on the other hand, you obviously are on, 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 on the whole back often by the product, right? You know, we ha you have an update to be pushed, you know, in the next four weeks, you know, we need to prioritize this and that and this and that. And while ad revenue can be very significant, I was, Actually, the case for Outfit 7, the main revenue 
revenue stream, um, is still kind of often considered uh, secondary by the, by, the, by the designers, right? Because you want to build an in-app experiences, you don't have this and that. So, so anyway, so it's kind of like, you know, take a lot of takes a lot of resources just to, you know, manage whether you have like, you know, small team or big, big company. So I mean, it sounds like there's there's a couple of things that come to my mind. We're talking about transparency, we're talking about dashboards, we're talking about kind of make, having to make lots of decisions about quite complicated areas with lots of, with not very much resource. Uh, it, it just struck me that there's, is there a question here about kind of how the platforms provide you with that information? I mean, are they providing you with this kind of information where you can make an informed decision? Or is there just simply too much data to be able to, to have cut through it? I mean, do you have any kind of view on that? Well, I mean, I think for us, like, you know, I think we have to get to a certain amount of scale in order to get to, um, uh, you know, asking for a certain amount of transparencies. Like, we could do, you know, direct deals with other publishers, um, you know, create a private marketplace or even have our own ad server, but that just takes, you know, more resources. Or I think there are ways that we could, you know, figure out um, how much the advertisers are really paying, you know, um, and then how much the cuts are that the ad networks are taking, but that just takes, you know, time and effort. Um, so. You know, for a smaller publisher like us, you know, I think it's just going to be tough. You know, mm. hopefully tools in the future will help us with that. Mm. Sir. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Take a mic, any mic. Uh, yeah, I definitely think with a lot of our partners, we do get some really awesome data and information. Sometimes it can be overload, but um, it's really just kind of understanding, you know, what you are looking for. So if you have that question in your mind and how do you derive from this and, you know, can you really, um, you know, see the results at the end, right? Um, but yeah, I think for a lot of ours, uh, and a lot of, uh, I'm noticing a trend in a lot of um, the platforms and companies that they want to work with the publishers. They want to work with everyone to kind of create that, you know, the experience that you want so that you can have a really good experience for your players, mm. right? So I'm really seeing that trend, which is amazing, because I think that publishers should be working with, you know, their networks and having that conversation and not being afraid to answer, like, ask those hard questions, mm -hmm. um, because at the end, it's all about the, the players. Mm. Yeah, I, I often keep talking about focus, like, it's, it's not, about, not about that monetization only, but, like, typically you see whether that's even 90-10 rule or 80-20, that, uh, that uh, you know, your key markets actually, you know, 10% of your, or 20% 20, 20 of your um, DAU, which is then, you know, US and some big Western markets actually drive 80% of your ad revenue. So make sure you focus on those markets. Don't spend that much time on, I don't know, Finland, where I'm from, because you likely likely have like 100,000 DAU, and it doesn't really make a difference if you, if you, you know, increase your ad, uh, like ECPMs by 10%. Uh, focus on the big things first, you know, I don't know, create, you know, look into top 10 markets you have, and, and, and it's very data driven, so yeah, there's a lot of data to kind of digest, but, you know, if you if you break it down, you take a look on, you know, where actually the money is, you know, that's going to take you somewhere mm. pretty quickly. I think I'll kind of follow on, because I think something Sarah saying was interesting, that a lot of the partners are interested in the player experience in particular, and that, that does resonate very much with some, one of the things that the Epidio guys were talking to me about, which is they're kind of keen to understand, you know, what the platforms themselves need to do to help that process, and you know what you would like to see those kinds of companies, you know, including you know, that would make a meaningful difference in terms of player experience. Uh, do you have any, any thoughts in terms of what it, what things specifically might, you know, might, is it about understanding the life cycle of a player? Is it about understanding the the, the key good that the, the triggers a purchase? Is what sort of things you know, or your key ad moment which allows them to then retain longer? I mean, I don't know what these things might be, but do you have any <laughs> thoughts? I mean, I, I guess for us, I mean, I think all our data, like we use, you know, uh, analytics, you know. Um, uh, actually, we, one of our uh, mediation platforms, Iron Source, and they actually have some pretty good tools. I think it's just a matter of you know bandwidth, my bandwidth, mm. you know, to just kind of dive in deeper. Um, you know, I think I guess my complaints is just you know I just want things a little easier for me. Mm. <laughs> so, uh, well, is that the question? I mean, is that the answer? So you know, the, actually, what what you want is them to propose 
ways to make life easier. And if you do yeah, this maybe, thing, maybe if they're yeah. like more proactive, you know, mm. saying like, "Hey, we know we're seeing," but they don't they don't really have that transparency into our user data. Yeah, you know, so I think that makes it tough, like mm. what they're collecting. Mm. Well, should they have more? I mean, I know I don't I honestly don't know the answer to these things. Um, I think I'm, I mean I think there are services out there that do mm. you know both those things. Yeah, but, you know. It's just a matter of like, you know, do I go up to our developers and go, hey, let's test out this SDK, and they're just like, fuck no, you know, so <laughs> <laughs> we don't have that time. But it does, you know, you know there's obviously there's a, a any platform that will have its mark its market data, it'll have an understanding of games like you that have have done certain things and the results of those behaviors. So it seems to me that there'll be a way that they can provide some level of more detail potentially, you know. Yeah. Uh, am I Am I wrong on that? No, no. I mean, I think you're right. Mm. Yeah, but uh, I don't know. I don't know what else to say on that. <laughs> Sarah, do you have a thought about that? Yeah, I mean, um, I think that's a double-edged sword. Kind of like, mm. should these, uh, you know, partners have more transparency and information um, mm. about your players? Um, because obviously, the more information you have, the you know better. Uh, experience that your players can have, um, but at the same time, they obviously don't, you know, privacy. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, well, yeah. that's <laughs> a big one. <laughs> you know, I, I, yeah. technically, maybe I don't want someone snooping into, you know, what mm. I've been doing. Um, but yeah, no, I think it's uh, it is important. Um, I know that with us, we want to move into a lot of branded ads. Um, branding is really important mm. now. Um, we're seeing a lot of um, these companies now moving into games, which mm. is awesome. Mm. Um, but a lot of them need to kind of understand who the players are in order for you to have, you know, the best experience. Mm. Um, so it's a give and take. If you want really, if you want to work with amazing ads uh, and brand partners um, to show their ads in your game that will really resonate with your players, um, then yeah, sure, you, you might want to share a few information, but you know you also have to think about the experience. Anonymized, of course. Uh, of course, <laughs> of course. Yeah. Yeah, there's also with, with regards to brands. There's also like you look into a, a little bit different model than having um, having like uh, I don't know Unity's and these guys running like game game game, game, game advertising. So. You know, you have the demand, like in the US, there's a lot of demand. I mean, for brands, for sure, there's a lot of demand from, you know, if you're a Rovio, the Angry Birds, and a lot of the like, big titles out there, it's going to be a different ball game if you're a smaller company without like a recognized game brand. Um, these brands actually want to take a look at the f impression first, you know, like, is this something I want to bid on? Is this something I want to place my, my ad on? Yeah. While, you know, you plug into any of the big networks and you have always demand, no matter how crappy your game is, you know. Um, <laughs> So that's that's just you know like the market needs a little bit little bit like uh, uh, development. I think uh, somebody I helped a bit uh, in the past uh, can't say the name, but a rather big publisher and uh, this kind of double sword. You you mentioned like this is maybe a good example that uh, we had an idea that we wanted to put more competition to the networks, you know, on a waterfall. So we wanted to be a little bit more transparent. Uh, we're at the ECPM levels. Now, if you are number one network, you know, you did whatever, 15 bucks in US, uh, number two gets $12, right? Or delivers $12 and, and so forth. You know, we had like eight, nine networks there. So we wanted to open this, not revealing the names of the network, but ECPM and how much traffic they actually mm -hmm. get. Uh, sounds like a great idea. Well, once you start looking into it, networks, and I did that too back in the days, it's easy to, it's it's not manipulated. It's easy to optimize the ECPM issue if you're a network, because basically you have let's say you have 100 campaigns, right? One of them is delivering 25 bucks an easy win, another one is delivering two bucks. Just don't show those poorly performing campaigns. So actually you're wait, you're working your way up on that, you know, kind of list. But actually at the end of the day you're only you know filling like five percent, right? So. Yeah. What happens when all the networks start to do this, they have the transparency, your, actually your total ad revenue decreases because people are not just filling. So, so eventually what happened, we started to show much more house ads. You know, there's a value for house ads, of course. But eventually, you know, we actually like, we did a small test and, and we thought, okay, that's not actually going to scale. So while the idea was good, I think it needs further development, how to really make it beneficial for, for everybody. So it sounds like what you're saying, if I have to do, so it's not just transparency. It's about actually meaningfully delivering the right kind of experience. Correct. Exactly. And it, it does resonate, particularly when you raise issues like brand. I remember back in the early days when I was, I am old, uh, when we were working out what banner ads were going to be at BT. You know, I, was, I used to work at British Telecom, a very, very 
very long time ago. Uh, we didn't even know what size and ra aspect ratio banner ads were going to be. And it took us ages, and none of the brands were ever interested at all. And it came down to a debate which was about reach. And it was only the point where banners became something that was critical mass and, and was, that the brand started coming in and using this. And obviously, we moved on from then. And I think the same thing. Every time I'm involved in any kind of ad conversation, it comes down to the same question. When are brands coming in? Oh, have we reached this kind of reach level that makes it relevant enough for them to choose that? And I wonder if we're now getting to that stage where mobile games are now particularly kind of significant enough where we now have to start thinking about that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, so we're working with a brand, Wiz Khalifa, and uh, <laughs> first thing the partner said after watching a bunch of ads, uh, we have an idle game, so uh, you get a boost uh, every time you watch an ad. Um, it was just like, all of these ads are so awful. I mean, they're like, you know, all game ads. Like, where are the brand ads, you know? And of course, like, the usual suspects, like, you know, Machine Zone, uh, King, you know, all advertised in our game. And, you know, they're saying that, you know, from a brand perspective, they think that these ads suck, you know? And it's like, why do people even watch these things? So there's like, where's Coca-Cola? Where's the, you know, the new Fast and Furious movie? Um, but, you know, I think the reality is that, you know, Machine Zone, you know, pays the most. So, you know, they're go always going to have, like, that, you know, uh, first view. Um, but that, that raises a question, because one of the things that we were talking about back in the Amplifier days was actually it wasn't just about who pays the most. It was, were people likely to click through? Mm -hmm. I mean, are we seeing the platforms paying attention to that more widely? I mean, are you, are you seeing people paying, asking that question at least? Well, I guess, yeah, when it comes down to it, I, I mean, I guess that they're paying for it. I don't know how much they're paying for it, so. Um. I think one of, the, one of the problems, again, with, I saw with brands, particularly having like a, like a direct sales team, um, actually uh, close here, like down in LA, and uh, the problem was that there's a lot of brands who are eager to jump in to a big game title, mm -hmm. already kind of somehow popular again, okay. Angry Birds, uh, but uh, you know, uh, similar stuff. So, so it's difficult when you're smaller. You, you want to establish yourself. Brands don't see the value, and I, I'd say, I, I, my opinion is that brands still don't see the value of a gamer, right? So they just don't understand, you know, why should I, as a Coca-Cola, spend money on, you know, advertising games? Uh, I think it's going to change, but it's going to take some time. But it's interesting because we're seeing that happening in esports. Yeah. yeah, I was so going to say... I think I, they do understand the I game. I do, yeah. <laughs> I was <laughs> yes. just going to say, I'm a yeah. little bit on the other side. Yeah. Um, I do see, actually, a lot of uh, brands maybe um, understanding, especially now you're seeing ads on traditional marketing, you know, like on Super Bowl, or you're going to yeah. see them, you know. Word of mouth is amazing, and all this traditional marketing that's coming out um, is really helping these game titles get out there, and brands are now starting to really notice. Um, and, you know, with our company, we're very niche. So we actually, like, we're really lucky that we understand exactly who our players are. Our, our community team's awesome. They they totally have a good idea of you know who what they do, what they like. You know, so working with us, we as a, like for brands, they would love us because we can say, yeah, sure, they're definitely going to pay attention to you. They're super engaged. I think one of my favorite examples of this is I, uh, back in the early days of the Java kind of industry, um, we had uh, a movie app. And um, it was amazing how you know certain types of people would do certain types of funding. In this case, it was a directory inquiry thing, but we also did things like Red Bull and Audi and various other things. And it's interesting how the same suspects come up time and time again. Red Bull, Audi in particular, did some amazing stuff in PlayStation Home. And it was because they, those guys have uh, an innovation budget specifically for advertising in new and refreshing ways. Uh, trouble is, it doesn't matter if it's successful what matters is that it's meant to make a good PR stud. But to transfer between the innovation budget that they have and the day-to-day -day budget comes back to the same problem. Does this have reach? So getting something that works really well on one operator at the time was nothing. They had to get something that would replicate in exactly the same you know, layout and structure with the same source material on every single European operator for them to be able to scale it up. And I think this is the sort of maybe the question we we're asking about this kind of monetization platforms is how do we get these platforms to be able to make those kinds of experiences, the branding kind of experiences, work in ways which are more scalable? Is that fair? Yeah, it goes back to the first one about 
then you know people don't generally have time, right? Mm. So the game companies don't have time to figure it out. They expect mm. the partner to come in with a great idea. I mean, this is how it's going to work. And, mm. and and I know so many games companies like super eager to try anything new, as long as the tech makes sense and the SDK is not like trillion gigabytes, <laughs> and takes two years to you know integrate. But so people are generally open to try, you know. And 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 but you need to then you need to deliver. You know, I've been a service provider, and if you get a chance, you need to deliver the first day. And, and, and that's how just how it is. It's interesting that you were talking about you know people are willing to put SDKs and stuff like that in. Is that actually true? Because I know there's a lot of games out there that have you know 10, 20 SDKs they're having to put into their game, and to put another one in is it just makes the whole wiring of the game so much more complicated. Yeah, generally we didn't do that. Mm. Of seven, that generally the public message of the public. So. Nine out of ten at the companies are, you know, reaching out to us. We said, no, we're not going to try this because we actually tried everything already back at the day. So we were very established with the setup of partners we had. But then whenever we saw maybe a new ad format, mm. some like that, you know, we would test with a smaller app. You know, we would dedicate some time into mm. it, and 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 only, you know, from that, you know, if things work, we would move on to the bigger titles that mm. have the, you know, crazy, crazy idea. You so. Yes, SDK is a red flag. People don't want to hear the SDK. But as long, you know, if you can deliver the value, I think there's a discussion. So we would plan out basically to drop certain SDKs. That was the plan. You know, mm. and, you know replace you know, something with something better, you know, if something comes up. So there's always a reason if there's value. So it does, it does raise that debate about whether you put the SDK directly into the game or if you use a partner to be able to provide that kind of service. Um, you know, it, it sounds like from the Outfit 7 point of view, it was worth them doing the direct integration in most cases. It was, I mean, we were also running our in-house mediation. So yeah. when these guys started to, started to advertise, so they, they didn't really have, I mean, there was nothing in the market. So they started to build, you know, in-house you know, over, the, over the years, um, you know, testing different things, but once you build your in-house stuff for four or five years with all the rules and mm. things, it's difficult to kind of, you know, come up with mm. the good justification to, 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 to rep, you know, kind of replace the, the, the one you have. Um, but I'd say that still the, like the, the dream is obviously like no SDK and mm. no work and, 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 and guaranteed <laughs> revenues, right? <laughs> That's yeah, the dream. that'd be great. Yeah. <laughs> but in the absence of <laughs> specific not there yet. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I mean, what about you, you guys? I mean, are you having, you know, are you willing to put experiments into your game? Are you, do you prefer if that experience runs through a partner? Yeah, uh, very similar to what mm. you guys do. We we like to test out, especially new, new, new partners on smaller games just to kind of see how it is. Um, it's really just testing out not only the SDK, but also, you know, can we work with these guys? Because that's also very important too, right? Um, and then later on, sure, uh, for bigger titles, we might want to try certain things. Um, but yeah, very similar to what you were saying. Yeah, I mean, for us, we go by you know recommendations from our friends, you know, who are developers. You know, have they had good experiences? Bad? Um, you know, are they making money? Mm. More money? <laughs> so uh, yeah, revenue driver would be huge. But you know, also we kind of have to balance like our priorities. Like, you know, uh, for instance, we're we don't have any live events in our game yet. So you know, do we want to test out a bunch of SDKs or you know focus on events? You know, obviously it's events. So you know, I think uh, for. From our perspective, I think it's better to you know delight the players than you know figure out like a new way to try to make money from them. Mm. But I guess events in a way it is, but you know it's more engaging than putting an SDK in. So how, how sophisticated do you get in terms of you know when you're going through that process and you're all trying to set all this all this up? Uh, you know, how much detail are you interested in? Are you going to set general rules? Are you going to get very specific? Are you going to kind of try and buy by the metadata on the individual who's looking at that particular? I mean, what sort of level are you after? And if you could get more, what would you want? I mean, data from what? From the SDK? Yeah, from, well, from, you know, let's say um, we can get some you know, real-time bidding based on the metadata of the device being used and some ID of the player. Do you want to get into that level of detail or you just want to say, I want to put this much budget up? I mean, I think it depends on scale. Like, mm. you know, for now, we just want to you know, uh, continue making a, a better game. Mm. Um, so you know, I, th I don't think we, we're ready for that kind of detail mm. yet. Although that would be nice if you know um, there are tools that make it that easier. Mm. 
Yeah, I think one of the companies I've been helping is like on the model is, I mean, if you look into bigger companies who maybe have like eight figure uh, ad revenues per year, um, can be very granular process yeah. of, of looking into things. So first first thing typically is like, you know, somebody outreaching with a new great idea or crazy idea, you want to check with your friends, your peers, you know, like, does this make any sense? You know, like anybody using it? Second one is actually, uh, if you still like it, second one is actually doing a very quick SDQ review, like by, yeah. by the devil, just looking into it. Does it actually crash everything? Does it make sense? Da, da, da. And doing the small test, et cetera, et cetera. Rather, like, you know, we had this process at Alpha 7 is very, like, particular. Like, okay, this is how we test all the new stuff. And and to be frank, you know, maybe, again, 9 out of 10 were disqualified already in the early days. So only 1 out of 10 gets through to some part of that funnel. So, um, and there's plenty of, you know, stuff available. Things pop in all the time, um, but over the over the years, you kind of built this knowledge of what actually works for you, what not, and and, and you kind of like from the first email, you often get a feel that okay, well, this is not going to help you, right? Mm. Uh, yeah, for us, it kind of sounds like everyone is looking for benchmarks, is looking for things to weigh, you know, historical data. For us, we're really lucky because we actually have games that we can look past, uh, pa past back and check out, you know, the data and how it was. Um, and so for us, that's really good to, so that we set up KPIs um, when we first start, when we launch a SDK. Um, that's definitely what we're looking at so that we can, you know, and just because they don't hit those certain KPIs doesn't mean that they're not a good company or a good SDK to work with. Maybe we just needed to have a little bit more conversation with them. Yeah. Uh, maybe it's not the right game. Maybe we just needed to try something else. Um, and so, I mean, everything is going to be different. Um, but as long as you have those certain benchmarks that you want to hit. And I think that benchmark thing is really interesting because if you are going your, on your own route, you, you only have the previous games you have. You can't really benchmark about against what else is happening at that point in time. Whereas if you're using a platform, let's say, you know, Apple or whatever, um, you can at least have them provide you with some insight whether you're performing in the right kind of quartile of, of the statistics for your particular genre. Um, and I wonder if that's a, an interesting aspect of kind of this idea of whether you go alone or whether you do it you know, with a partner, is this kind of benchmarking thing. Are you kind of interested in sort of the benchmarking aspect of things? Um, <clears throat> And how do you know? know how do you know what success looks like? Is really what I'm asking. Yeah. You know. <laughs> um, I don't know. I guess that's maybe someone else take this question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, um, we really think about it. Yeah, I mean, working with a partner, like, let's say, if we work with a ginormous partner, yeah. and they have all sorts of data about, you know, what, you know, the media, um, you know, what other people are doing, what what uh, are the averages out there, you know, are we hitting below or high, um, compare, you know, having that competitor data, mm -hmm. really understanding, you know, if our customers are very similar to that person's customers, can we get, like, some kind of data, not that we have to, you know, it doesn't have have to exactly know everything, no, no. but you know, definitely having that comparative data mm. to see. And then, I mean, we have it for so many other other aspects in marketing, like you know, email marketing. You know exactly what you know benchmarks you want to hit for those, right? Okay. What's your open rate? What's your conversion? Exactly. If we had something very similar and standardized, um, that would be amazing for publishers, mm. so they can really understand and not have the historical data mm. uh, on hand for your own game. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, one of the biggest problems, actually, like what I've seen is that when you try new networks, is that you know, I'm not, maybe it's human, maybe it's natural. People put a lot more effort when they sign you up. They put the first couple of months are like great. Then when you stabilize, uh, and I've seen it like the, the, the extreme is when back at the Applifer actually, we signed somebody like that rather big with the strategy game. They never monetized with ads. They did very well this sign of rewarded video placements. Insanely high easy pairs. Mm -hmm. We're looking the fifty dollars box, fifty, 50 uh, bucks, you know, plus in in, in US, etc. Over the time, obviously, it's, it goes down, right? Because you know people are you know used to it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that obviously happens. And 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 but you know the problem I was mentioning is like the networks put a lot of effort in the beginning. That's what you do in every business. You sign up a new client. You want to make sure you want to work them properly, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But that starts to be somewhat a challenge sometimes that. When, when, when you move on after a few for first few months, you know, it starts to stabilize. And you're gonna like just another partner. Mm -hmm. Maybe not that much hold you know, handing handing, you know, uh, your your you know, holding your hand, stuff like that. So it's like, you know, but this just needs, you know, proper like from like a BD to account management and needs to be like a proper handover. So again what this goes back to is that the game company needs to be fully on top of it and, 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 and challenge these guys, etc. And then again, you know, there's not that much often time for that. 
And just sound like, I mean, I think if, you know, go back to the conversation I had with the Apple guys, it's like, what we, we're basically saying back to them is, look, you know, we, smaller companies who are getting into this don't have the time and resources to make, you know, deep strategic decisions that are finitely detailed. Instead, they want to be able to make sure they can make smart choices based on information that's benchmarked. So, you know, give them the ammunition they need with the resource they've got to be able to do that well. But also to be able, as that company scales, to provide them with the levers to be able to get to the nuances that allows them to scale their revenues appropriately. And then at the same time, help them innovate by looking at where the new areas are, whether it's an ad format, whether it's brands, whether it's whatever else. And it sounds to me that it's basically about creating partnerships at the end of the day and realizing the needs of the developer, you know, they, they need helping to support them through their ongoing process. And the value that a, a partner has, whether it's a you know, mediation platform or an ad network or whatever else, that value proposition is their ability to take all of their partners' learnings and to be able to share that in ways that are effective for everybody. Is that a reasonable summary? I guess, yeah, for us, like I think you were asking about benchmarks earlier, and mm. I think Unity Ads put out a, a, like a bunch of you know, different um, yeah, not white papers, but just you know results from like, mm. hey, these guys are using Unity ads. They're getting you know this much ARPDAO, yeah. and I think that kind of helped us because we were looking at, you know, which what kind of game should we make? You know, we were, we're doing uh, idle games, mm. and uh, my previous company we were more mid core core games, and we didn't do a lot of reward videos, mm. but reward videos made sense in idle games. Mm. So well, it's the future play guys and the next game guys, and a few others that have done since. And mm -hmm. I think you know I, I don't work in the ads team anymore, by the way. I work in a different team, which I'll tell you about another time. <laughs> um, but it's really interesting how that re that was really useful for us because totally. you know it's that transparency which is incredibly important. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I think one of the one of the key we had back at the Applifier, why mm -hmm. we got so successful, rewarded video, and of course also continued that, like, you know, growth mm -hmm. of the Unity acquired us, mm -hmm. was that Applifier is actually built by game companies, like yeah. gamers, right? So yeah. these guys wanted to build games, they suck with it, they had to pivot, eventually the two different, you know, corners and routes, but I mean, they, I think, you know, the team understood games mm -hmm. a lot better than the average ad tech, and that's the key. You, you can't build a great partnership if you don't actually understand the, the business and the market and the games, and that's, that's the key. I think on that note, I'm just going to see if there's any questions from the audience. Anyone else got any questions? Oh, there's one right at the front here. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, sorry if I said that wrong, but I had a question about uh, like brand safety. Uh, have you found it challenging to monetize a game like Wiz Khalifa's Weed Farm? Or is it 2017 and times have changed and no one cares? Well, we definitely had precedents, these guys over here. <laughs> uh, you know, Pot Farm, but That could have been a different panel the, together, the OG. couldn't it? Um, but yeah, I, I would say it's definitely tough. I mean, we can't, you know, get featured by the app stores. Um, you know, obviously anything with the name Weed. Um, even if I'm, you know, trying to advertise, I just got an email from like Pandora's, you know, ad, um, ad folks trying to do, you know, buy some UA from them, um, and you know, they're just like, sorry, we can't advertise, you know, you know, these type of drugs. So it's definitely tough. Um, but I mean, there, are, you know, interests out there. I just hope that you know, regulation gets you know, a little easier, legalization, you know, spreads. But you know, who knows? <laughs> We're definitely in the perfect city to have that conversation. <laughs> cool. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Any other rare uh, questions? I think on that note, lunch is beckoning us, and so I will thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, panel. I uh, hope you got that, a lot of value out of that, and uh, go and enjoy your lunch. Thank you very much. Thank you.